Hi, folks. Steve Urban here, founder and CEO at recruiting firm RiderFlex. If you enjoyed today's guest interview, please give it a like and be sure to subscribe to the RiderFlex podcast. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Try the number one marketing platform for small business. Everything you need from design to marketing to CRM. Learn more at marketing360.com. Marketing 360, fuel your brand. Dan, I, uh, my wife works with our company too. So, so our day job at Rider Flex is we're a recruiting and staffing firm, right? But like that's how we make a living. And then the podcast is, is additional marketing and things for us and content. But uh, anyway, my wife works with us now here at the company too, as we've gotten bigger. And one of our goals was to try and work remotely from the road a little bit, traveling in our RV and experience in the country because we're empty nesters, of course, and the kids are gone. And so uh, over the last 30 days, we've tested it a few times. You know, we're kind of feeling our way. And uh, she's right over here in the, in the camper right next to me. Uh, and we're traveling. We got to run down to Oklahoma and take care of some family property stuff. But uh, anyway, my point is, yeah, I'm in my, I'm in my, remote, uh, uh, my remote studio. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the, it's uh, part of this is the power uh, of what we've learned yes. through COVID, right? And, and we've learned uh, all kinds of things that matter. We learned, um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I want to say, you know, our company, we've been, we're back in the office two days a week. Okay. We, um, I, I should say three days a week. We started uh, September last year as COVID was waning. We went down to, uh, we, we, we said, hey, as kids go back to school, we're going to come in Mondays and Wednesdays. I got you. And just, so, so, you know, we're trying to do the, this hybrid kind of version of things. Uh, we were on the front end of that. So, but there is something you lose by not being together. There is. That, that, yeah. that people, yeah. uh, uh, especially as you're onboarding, bringing in new people, um, you, you know, hiring, uh, you know, hiring you guys to find people, yeah. whatever that goal is. The bottom line is it's harder to do remotely, right? So that that yeah. that's a real thing. Yeah, uh, it's hard to have a company culture, and and we did all kinds of things throughout the process to ensure we had culture yeah. and that we were delivering on what that meant. But the bottom line is, so we're back two days a week, and then um, and I told them then probably in the new year we're gonna we're gonna add a third day, and so but it, when the new year started we shut down again. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, and, and and again, we never really were shut down. We just said, "Don't you don't have to you don't have to be here." Gotcha. Some people always came. Some people always came in. Yeah. Uh, and then we said Tuesdays or Thursdays, one of those days, and it and likely it might be your department chooses which day. I see. So you know, the marketing department's in on Thursday. The customer success department's in on Tuesdays. So we have people here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, and uh, in general. Yeah. And then on top of that, you know. There's people here five days a week that yeah. want to be here. You know, it's a, I, I've talked to many CEOs. You know, we've we've had a ton of people on the podcast, and most CEOs, most of them are doing a hybrid, you know, mixed bag of something, kind of like what you're doing. You know, very few people that I know personally or that I've interviewed have a hard line one or the other, um, and it's and it's still a mixed bag. Now, RiderFlex, we, we've been remote 100% since the beginning of the company. So for us, even way before COVID, that was just, too, you know, right. there was no difference for us. But uh, because I have, we have recruiters all over the country and it's just easier. But um, you're right, though. And I, you know, I ran a couple of $40 million companies as a CEO before I started RiderFlex. And uh, yeah, you know, the water cooler, the lunchroom, the meetings in person. I mean, it does. There, there's a lot to be said for it, you know, uh, and, and the biggest thing is, and then we'll move on to, you know, Dan, but uh, the biggest thing is the sharing of ideas and thoughts, because, you know, even with us, you know, I, the recruiters will hear at RiderFlex, you know, I'll be talking to one of them individually and they'll say, oh, I found this other little trick to find people and now I'm doing this and I'll go. That's great. Have you shared that with anybody? <laughs> have we have we told yeah. anybody else about that? And uh, you know, if they're in the office, they see each other and they're like, "Oh, hey, Mary. By the way, I saw." There's just more sharing and more collaborating, you know, in person. So yeah, well, and and you know, the, the, as we get later on, we'll talk a little bit about my company. But the 
there, there is a truth that our tool actually is an enablement tool for uh, that can be leveraged for you know remote work, right? How do yeah. I find out that yeah. information? How do I do yeah. things? Yeah. Um, it, it, but you know, when you talk about we're going to get into Dan, the reality is who we are um, as individuals should be reflected in who we are as leaders, mm -hmm. right? And so and and um, and so I don't I don't want to separate them too much yeah. because I own the culture, I own the content. I own, I own who everybody represents to our marketplace, but I also, that is a reflection of me and I'm proud of that. Right? Yes, yes. So, so yes. Uh, I, I just want to be clear, um, you know, leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, especially, right. You know, it's, it's when you have a hundred thousand employees, um, it's harder for, to be a direct reflection of the CEO and likely the CEO isn't the founder. Right. But when you're a founder, when you're an entrepreneur, um, you're building a culture that is a reflection of who and what you want. Mm, no and as doubt. you, uh, as you created rider flex, it's, it, it is a reflection of you yep. in the, in all good, in good ways and bad ways, and bad. Right? <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> um, uh, uh, I don't, I don't hear. Um, so are you from Minnesota originally? Cause I don't hear the typical Minnesota accent. Yes, my mother. My mother would be proud proud that that's the case. I am not from Minnesota originally. Okay, uh, though I'm from Milwaukee, so it's not like it's uh, you know, oh, right. it's not that different. Um, now, but when we you don't said, have the, when you said Milwaukee, when you said the word, it was a little. That's absolutely a thing. <laughs> Milwaukee is is pronounced as I do, not as the rest of the world pronounces it. Right? Um, there's a there's a twang to it. There's a there's a heritage, a Native American heritage to the yeah. to the to the names uh, in in uh, in Wisconsin there, mm -hmm. uh, and here you know in Minnesota too, but. So were the, you, uh, uh, did you grow up a Packers fan then? And then you, now you live in Vikings country. How did that work? <laughs> dude. Uh, uh, there we go. What do you mean? Grew there up? we go. So uh, oh, you know, I, oh. the Packers, I, 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 I can pull out all kinds of Packers. <laughs> um, so I, I want, I have to, so this is who I am. I'm a Packers fan. That's cool. Um, the Packers. I'm also an owner of the oh. Packers. Oh, oh, the Packers oh, right. That's are, right, are, right, right. right. Yeah, are owned by the community. That's right. And so that's that's always been the case. But when the Packers want to put an addition on their stadium, they just sell more stock. I see. Un unlike going to the tax. And part of it is because Brown County uh, and Green Bay, you know, Green Bay only has 140,000 people. Right. <laughs> right. So if they're paying the taxes to build the stadium, uh, it's an impossibility. Yeah, right. It right. doesn't. Yeah. It, it, the math never works out. Yeah. But this is the kind of gift I give because I have two business partners. Mm -hmm. One is a Jets fan and one is a Vikings fan. Oh, <laughs> And so it, last year, um, the Packers had an, their third stock offering where they were selling stock. Okay. And so for the holidays, I gave each of my business partners a share of the Packers. Really? Wow. Which, which is like the ultimate gift. Wow. Because you can't sell it. There's no, there's no value. I if see. the Packers ever get sold, the Green Bay VFW gets all the money. <laughs> <laughs> so making it so the Packers will never be sold. I see. Um, so the shareholders are shareholders. So yesterday I get a text from uh, one of my business partners, which was saying, you know, I, I, uh, I just want you to know this is the gift that keeps giving because he got the annual shareholder annual meeting and proxy vote mailing how, yesterday. How, how about that? Every year he's going to get stuff from my Packers to his Vikings. House. <laughs> uh, he can't tell his Viking friends that he owns Packers stock, right? Oh, it's, he put it on Facebook. <laughs> there, there are, um, his family chat. He, he texted me once the what's going on in his family texting about the NCAA tournament and can they root for Wisconsin because Minnesota is not there. And, <laughs> and of course his brother chimes in, but you're a Packer owner. <laughs> so it's, it, trust me. It's, it's, it's literally the best gift I've ever given to a non-Packer fan. That <laughs> is, that is pretty cool. So you grew up in, so Milwaukee, the area, is that where you went to high school and all that? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I, I, I guess I officially left when I was 18. Not, I mean, not uh, going to college. I mean, why'd not, you go to, to why, why'd you go to the university of Minnesota? Well, how'd that happen? Oh, I didn't. I went to Drake university and I still don't know how that happened. Oh, that's right. You went to Drake. Oh, that's right. You went to Drake. I, I got a master's at, at the university. Oh, that's, right, that's right. That's right. Okay. All right. And why'd you go to MBA. Drake? Uh, <laughs> so I have, I have two great, I mean, a, a guidance counselor kind of conversation pushed me that way. Okay. And then I went and visited and, um, and you know, I had a great time. Yeah. And I, and the truth is we, it was a great education and, and great, you know, it was a great experience four years in, in Des Moines. Uh, the, uh, you know, the Mecca of Iowa and, uh, and, um, and, uh, but it's a, you know, it's a college town. It's also the capital city. It's, it, 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 it's cool. It's fun. And, uh, and I have, I mean, I've been back, but I haven't, uh, I didn't stay. We'll just say it that way. Now, when you were in college now, by the way, coincidentally, I went to college and got my bachelor's from 85 to 89. So basically the same years you were in college, right? Man, that was a good time, wasn't it, Dan? That was, that was a good time. Yeah, um, <laughs> the, lots of good, uh, lots of lots of good times. I, uh, you know, the, the the even today I look at college um, as the process of maturing and yes. learning good yes. stuff, but yes. also learning life balance. Life balance, and uh, yes. But it, so when it comes to hiring, and this again, going back to my my thoughts. If somebody presents me the the 4.0 student that didn't yeah. participate no. in college, yeah. I am not interested. Yeah, I totally agree. I would yeah. much rather have a 3.0 that did 16 activities. Yes. Any activities, that's what, anything, anything, right, sport, right. sports, because student government, whatever. <laughs> whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. The, the bottom line is I want you not to have matured and understand yes. that there's ramifications for going out and drinking on a Wednesday night, to <laughs> doing whatever you need to do on Thursday. <laughs> I want you to understand that you have all of these priorities, all of which have to get successfully done. We don't just give you one thing to do yeah. and expect it to come back. One thing to do, come back. Yes. And so yes. if you didn't embrace the opportunity, um, I'm concerned. Yep, I agree. You know, and there's a lot of talk, right, about uh, should kids still invest the money in college because all you got to do is ask Google and Google gives you all the answers. Yeah, that's true. But but the people skills, the communication skills, all these other things you learn to navigate time management, judgment, all those things are just man, those are really important. And I, and I still think kids should, should go off to do that because it, yeah, it helps them grow up. You just learn so many things. I mean, so many things. So um, your folks though, what what'd your folks do? And did you have any siblings? I want to ask about that real quick. Mom, dad, siblings. I, I have all of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a physician, uh, internist, endocrinologist. Um, okay. And, uh, and, you know, uh, just an awesome, awesome individual. Uh, you know, if, if, if you have a question of ethics or what you should do, you could, mm. you could look at my, what my father would do and, and do that. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's okay. the, it's the right thing. Uh, my mom, uh, homemaker, uh, three kids. Um, she, uh, uh, she, I mean, she was, she was awesome. She, she, she departed too early. Uh, okay. and, uh, so it's, I mean, literally it's been 20 years. Oh, wow. Um, Whoa. 20, what a, yeah, oh, you mind yeah. me asking, you mind me, that was, she, so she passed away early. You mind me asking what happened? Uh, breast cancer. Uh, oh, you know, tough, man. uh, she, uh, absolutely. Um, we were all adults, which was kind of good. I mean, so we didn't, yeah. we didn't lose a mother that was raising us. Mm. Um, that said we lost our mother. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, but your and dad's my dad's 80. He's, he's 80. 89. Okay. <laughs> he's right. 89. Uh, he actually broke his hip on New Year's Eve, which oh. is often the downfall. Of, you know, not it's yeah. the beginning of the end for yeah. most people. Yeah. And my father um, uh, had a conversation with us, and he's like, and and he's very aware of the, that data. And his response was, "Yeah, I'm not. That's not going to be me. Okay. And I think he's better today than he was three years ago. Really? Like, like his mindset has changed that." I'm 89. I'm going to enjoy myself. 
uh, I'm going to do and be and and you know breaking my hip isn't going to kill me. That's um, good. That's you know, good. So you and you uh, had what? Two brothers, brother, sister. What do you have? I have two sisters. Okay. So I'm the I'm the middle child, but right. you know right. a, a brother, a, a son, in a family uh, of three with two daughters is is the only child. Case. <laughs> just ask my just ask my sisters. <laughs> Uh, did now were you a were you a good kid, rebel kid, were you in trouble, like straight, like in the library every day, sneaking out the window? So, like where, where were you in there? Um, in general, I would say I was a I was a very good kid. Okay, but I wasn't a very good student. Oh, uh, those are right. those are not necessarily the same. Thing. I wasn't I wasn't studious. Um, and, you were in jail. You were in jail every, every uh, once a month. Either. I, 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 I have, uh, I avoided jail now, you know, with the TSA now I've, I, I, the biggest question was, do I want to be fingerprinted? Cause you know, I, uh, but I, but I did cause I want convenience more than I care about I gotcha. my, my gotcha. the likelihood of me committing a crime. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So no, um, all right. Nothing crazy, yeah, but there. you know, but I, nothing like that. And, uh, um, but but we had fun in in, in all kinds of great ways, uh, both as a family. But my my sisters would say I I might have you know controlled the the television, the <laughs> one television we had, because you know I could physically uh, block block them away from being able to change the channel. By the way, for the right. listeners, for the listeners, me and Dan. We were the remotes, the remote controls for our dads, yeah. right? We were dad would be yeah, like, "Hey, because you had to get up, grab the knob, turn it." <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, when we got our first color TV, which had actually had a remote, but it turned the knob, it would go chunk, 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 yeah. chunk, and it would go. You know, so you're pushing the button, and it would turn the knob. Oh, uh, oh, you, uh, wow! Was, you had was, one of those. Whoa, was the you, mechanism? Okay. <laughs> uh, but that was, I mean, I grew up with a first with a, I mean, I watched the, the moon landing on a, yeah. on a black and white uh, television at our debt. So yeah, yeah all kinds buddy. of, yeah, um, but, but I loved, so th- one of the things though, say, was I a good kid? I love technology. Okay. And I was, so I, I, and I like, I mean, I took things apart. I would see how they were like, you know, my uh-huh. dad would, we'd go to the garage sale and he'd buy an old television or something. And I would, tear it apart and oh really okay, out, okay. Know, just, it, like the whole purpose was you know see how see what's inside learn about it do things okay. um and then embarked upon you know i'm i'm in high school and uh, uh I, I worked at a video store i worked at a computer store i mean i uh, we had an open campus for the second half of high school and i would leave you know i, I would be done with my classes at you know 123 yeah, and uh, and I would be at work at one thirty. So I, I was kind of an entrepreneur and and uh, and learning the, the the business world well before um, most. So uh, wow. a little wow. on the geek, you know, a little on the geeky side. Okay, uh, I was the AV guy in, in you know grade school, high school. Now, when you talk about did I what, did I do things wrong, and I'll have to apologize to a couple of you know Mr. Miller and a couple of teachers in, in my grade school, but. <laughs> Um, so what we did wrong is uh, we had keys to the school, but oh. we would go in and, and use the dark room. We would go in and I mean we 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 didn't do damage. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the last day um, after uh, after kind of shutting down the eighth grade, uh, and we were leaving, you know, a couple of days after school ended, and Mr. Miller uh, asked me, he said, "Can I have the key back?" So he was very <laughs> aware. He was very aware wow. that we that we had keys. Now, wow. in wow. fairness, in fairness, and this is the point that is my first disclosure ever. I still have the key because <laughs> I I didn't only make one copy, Mr. Miller. <laughs> I made two. Oh, there he is. We got we <laughs> got to get this to him. We got to get this to him. For sure. <laughs> wow. So, so you were so yeah. You were the t- kind of techie, uh, mechanical entrepreneurial spirit early on and then i mean great career we won't have time to cover everything you've done but i guess you're you're the biggest when you really started to to take off is when you landed that job at 3m and you were there for eight years that kind of that kind of started the career didn't it well so before then i had actually worked for apple and microsoft uh when i mean just just to say like um yeah these are 
uh, in the eighties. So in these the are 80s. entrepreneurial companies, right? Yeah, right. And so I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I was there. Uh, I was at an Apple dealer, and then at Apple as the Macintosh came out, and and um, wow, you know, Guy Kawasaki, who's obviously one of the 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 he was the Apple evangelist and wrote wrote, wrote the book The Art of the Start, which all entrepreneurs should read. Mm, good one. Um, the Art of the Start. Well. So I mean I met Guy and worked with him back wow. in, in the in the day, right? Oh, so, you met him. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, well, and actually, if you Google Dan Mallon and Guy Kawasaki, you'll come up with a blog post cool. of uh, of that he did visiting me, playing hockey in Minnesota, what? and doing a bu- bunch of different things. So, okay, that's pretty cool. He, he took up hockey later in life, and so I invited him to play in the U.S. Pond Hockey uh, Championship. <laughs> Uh, which uh, a friend of mine started that we just we just helped uh, cool. do it, and then Pretty and cool. then he gave a presentation to some entrepreneurial efforts, a couple of things for me uh, as as part of the that deal. So now see now see he uh, he along with several others right there earlier in your life had an immediate effect, right? An immediate an immediate you're, you're watching them, yeah. you, you're the mentoring, the, you're following their leads, their mannerisms, the way they communicate. Well, that's really good stuff. Yeah, the fact the fact that when I looked, at, first of all, I love that you put your LinkedIn profile all the way back to to eighty five. I love that. I wish more people would do that. Um, and then when I saw Apple, Microsoft, and three M, your first three, I'm like, holy shit! He he was. <laughs> he got, those are three excellent starts. Uh, very nice, very nice. Okay, yeah, so so the the interesting thing going to three M. Well, I should say at Microsoft, you know, I was there for the first quarter they were public where we literally had the whole company beer and pizza in a, conf- cool. a big conference room at cool. Microsoft. So I'm mean, just cool. putting perspective there, right? Very uh, cool. My, my entry class had, had dinner with Bill Gates, uh, you know, it, you know, 30 people and bu- inclusive of Bill Gates. You know. nice. So it was, it was a very different um, time frame and a op- set of opportunities. Yeah. Uh, as I get, went into 3M, um, uh, you know, it was, uh, again, it's, it's an awesome company, right? Yeah. It's entrepreneurial, it's innovative. Uh, and, uh, and I had a series of managers there that, um, that allowed me to do what an entrepreneur would do. Matter of fact, one, one of them said, uh, said, uh, to me once, you know, and actually to, to my man, to her management that, Hey, give Dan no budget tell them what you need done, just let them go figure it out and we'll come out with something. And so in my business units, and I, I, I did IT for five divisions there and uh, laboratory computing, dump some manufacturing, various things. And uh, yeah, I, I would just borrow money, find budget, do things. And we ended <laughs> up building, as an example, the corporate, we built the system for new product development, the, pro- the entire process but we made it digital. And, and so, um, and, uh, and then the corporation actually adopted our system. They had to make it more robust because they had to take more factors into, into account, but you know, it was the basis. And so there's, there's three or four systems that ended up that I created for my business units that ended up being corporate um, corporate initiatives. Did you know, I mean, were you thinking at that stage? Cause at that point you were in your, what you were in your late twenties, maybe yeah. were you yeah. thinking, were you thinking I'm going to be an entrepreneur at that point? Or were you just like, I'm just, I'm just having fun. I'm working hard. I'm moving up. I mean, um, you know, it's funny you say this cause, uh, I always was an entrepreneur. I mean, okay. going back to snow shoveling, paper routes, okay. you know, okay. uh, just figuring out how to how to do stuff. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's a thing called an entrepreneur, which is mm-hmm. inside of a big company yes. doing those same things. Yes. And I did not think I needed to leave. I didn't. Um, okay. I had, uh, you know, I was doing cool stuff, right? And I got it was all opportunistic. Yeah. Um, I went to. Uh, uh, I actually, crazy thing, I, I was offered a job after a few years to go work um, for a company called Authorware. Okay. And uh, it was run by a gentleman named Bud Culligan. And I was interviewing with Bud and he went, you know, it was a system engineering kind of position in, in, in Authorware. 
Now, most people don't know the history of Authorware. No. Spin out of Control Data, which was one of the original computer companies. Mm. Um, and when the Silicon Valley used to be in Minnesota. Okay. Um, and so anyway, Authorware was acquired by Adobe. Bud Culligan went on to be the CEO of Adobe. Oh. And, uh, and it is all of the animation and other kinds of stuff that Adobe did was based on, on that acquisition. How about that? Um, so, it, so it was a pretty, it's pretty cool opportunity. Again, um, and they were offering me you know, substantially more money than I was making at 3M. And again, talk, going back to my father, his response was, well, if you're worth that in three years, just think what you'd be worth in 10. <laughs> nice you know, right and so uh and so i i didn't go and i stayed with with um with 3m and uh and i did i got to do all kinds of cool That's stuff right. and one of which was uh creating the original 3m.com what so, really like so yeah so so i was part of the you know a six person kind of core team uh that launched 3m.com oh, and cool. uh cool. and so and it was a it was at that point that I started doing a, a little public speaking people. Okay. And then, uh, and then similarly, um, so I started a company doing consulting on the side for companies. To was, that spot use by, was that spot by spot? No, that's uh, oatmeal media. Okay. All right. Uh, oatmeal media, comfort food for the internet hungry. Uh, you know, in the, and again, this is in, uh, this is in the nineties, right? right? So 90, yeah, wow. um, yeah. 94, 95, I'm, yeah. I'm consulting my wife, um, uh, uh, with a, with a young child in hand was, um, uh, was doing kind of sales uh, opportunities on this, uh, helping me set up what I could do. Okay, and see. then, and then I was, you know, delivering it through, a. Uh, a partnership uh, with a third party called Imagine It. And oh. uh, my partner and one of the partners there, founder was a guy named Scott Lippman, who's still my partner today. Oh, really? Holy yeah. cow. As in, as in co-founder or equity holder in Lucy? So, or... so co-founder, but okay. so going back, so Oatmeal Media used his company as its back end and delivering. Mm, then mm, uh mm. then oatmeal media was acquired by his company and then and we were both acquired at the same time by amation which is a spin-out 3m so you guys have been friends for what 25 years how long oh well we we just like to say 20 plus because we don't <laughs> want as entrepreneurs we don't want to seem too old <laughs> i just dated it right you know uh, we started in uh in the you know in the mid to late nineties together in some form. Uh -huh. And we have been partners in business together. So, you know, a mag, um, yeah, we became a, a mation. So oatmeal media, then a mation, then we bought it back from a mation as imagine that. Then we sold it to WPP as J Walter Thompson. Now, uh, that, then can, we, I pause, can I pause yeah. you right there? Was that yeah. set? Was that exit? Was that your first big payday or was that a small payday? Like, was that, was that a life-changing exit or a small one? Just, just want to. Yeah. Well, so first of all, when we sold to Amation, we thought it was life-changing because we were young. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and it was, and it was in the time frame, right? We're, we're like, uh, like, uh, like know, enough we're... to, enough to buy a house, but not enough to retire kind of a thing or. or... Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, All right. No, it was, I mean, it was, it was lucrative and then we bought it back and okay. then we sold it again. And so both, which was then much more, uh, much more life-changing okay. uh, on this, on the second iteration. Um, and, Congrats. Congrats. Uh, and so, Congrats. and then we got to work, uh, you know, with, um, again, we were uh, the digital uh, component and became the non, all non-traditional component inside J Walter Thompson um, we had 13 offices, 12, 12 in the U S one in the UK. Now, let me ask uh, you right there, yeah. but you technically with, for Jay Walter talk, you were in a quote, an employee then, right? Is that right? Yeah. How, how was that? I want to just ask you, I don't mean to interrupt your flow, but I, you know, so many er, so many entrepreneurs that had an exit that then go on to like, okay, now I'm going to help somebody else or I'm going to do work for somebody else. And all of a sudden they're, they have like a, a boss 
that they have to ask them when they can go on vacation, but they used to be an entrepreneur. Sometimes that's a tough transition. Yeah. So it's always a tough transition. I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to say that, but look at it slightly differently. You always have a, a boss, you have that's, a board, you have a bank, true, you true. have other people that are affecting. True. So I, what we do is we said, and we said, Hey, we exchange the board and the bank here for a big, okay. you know, global, global right. corporation. Okay. Um, okay. You know, WPP owned, uh, uh, you know, again, a big holding company owned it. Okay. Um, so that part is easy. Okay. Uh, and we, um, because we had, uh, you know, the structure of the deal is there's an earn out. So, okay. so, yep. Yep. but when you have an earn out, it gives you control. Yeah. So, so we did have a boss and I don't okay. want to make it sound like we didn't. And we had to report in, we had to have financials. We had to follow procedures. We had to do all kinds of things. Um, some of which we really didn't want to do, but we, that's, that's the nature of the beast. That is. They paid us to do that. The second part though, is we had uh, control of our organization and it grew inside of them. Right. Okay. So, so, uh, you know, I ended up being, uh, you know, chief operating officer for North America for this whole non, the non-traditional advertising businesses. And yeah. So, now by, and by this you know, time, in, by this time in your career, operations and leadership is, is becoming really who you are an ops leadership guy uh is that yeah it's, okay yeah i know it's funny because that's really not who i am okay um, okay I, i'm uh i'm the visionary strategy oh. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. kind of leader scott my partner is much more methodical and, and operations focused mm. but it, truth is it's part of the deal like you know we get yeah. we have to do we have to um okay. you know make things work by the way nice combo uh, by the way when you when your co-founder that, that is one of the best combinations, if we can pause for the listeners right there. If you're looking for a co-founder, first of all, make sure they don't have the exact same skill set. Make sure they're complimenting you in some way. But boy, if you have a strategic, creative visionary with an operational, tactical, keep the train on time person, man, that is, whew, that's a good combo. Yeah, there's... Um... Uh, I, I don't know if you are familiar with traction and uh, and the EOS operating system, entrepreneurial operating system. No, by Gina no, Wakeman. no, no, no. So um, it's actually it's it's really, really uh, just funny because if, if I pull off the books on my shelf, I have Guy Kawasaki's Art of the Start. <laughs> but but the second one here, uh, Traction by Gina Wickman. OK, and this is an operating system of how to run entrepreneurial companies. Mm. And we started using it years back and we've used it across multiple companies. Um, and the coolest part is it's an operating system on how to use, uh, how to use, how to operate a company. Okay. But the best part is, so when you get an offer from our company, you get the book Oh. with the offer. And we say, this is how we run the company. I Be see. ready. I see. Because okay. it's, it's vocabulary, it's process. It has nothing to do with what our product is, what our services or how we do it. And so, um, Traction uh, is uh, a book about, you know, Get a Grip on Your Business by Gino Wickman. Uh, there's a second book uh, written by Mike Payton and Gino Wickman um, called Rocket Fuel. And Rocket Fuel, which I don't have sitting in front of me, so I'm less, much less impressive. But Rocket Fuel is about the, exactly what you talked about. In the, the concept is there's a visionary and an integrator in the Traction book, right? The visionary integrator does all the operation stuff, yep. and uh, which is just an awesome me mechanism and methodology. Yes. But the second part, the second part of this is Rocket Fuel is just a book about how those two, when they're working together right, can take off, take the business yeah. to different places. And and uh, Mike Payton, uh, or just Payton as we know him, is uh, a traction implementer. He was the second visionary of traction after Gino uh, left that role um, and coincidentally is on the seventh floor of this building. Really? So, okay. Uh, you guys own the building, I, by the way? So you guys no, own no, the no, no, no. Okay. Okay. No, okay. not at all. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, you know, I just, I see his car every morning. That, uh, that's, uh, you know, gotcha, uh, but gotcha. it's really cool stuff. It's, it, 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 I would recommend the read for any entrepreneur. There are, they, they have a implementer community where you can get, help 
taking you through the process or you can self-implement. Um, but it really, really takes, um, can take you to the next level, direct you how to do it and makes, you know, meetings more efficient, days more efficient and takes a, a two page business plan created annually that takes you on a annual quarterly and, and a long-term kind of vision that you can share and communicate with your teams. I appreciate I, you. I rec- yeah. I appreciate that recommendation and thank you for sharing it with the listeners. And I want to end that little segment there by saying to all of the creative geniuses and visionaries out there, especially if you've made something or created something or built something and you're a creative person, please surround yourself with an implementer, an operator, connect yourself with that person, or you will eventually spin off into the forest and never, never land and, never actually get anything done <laughs> uh, only a hundred percent i have 20 ideas a day and maybe one of them is good yeah, it's, yeah. you know it's just so critical okay um i want to do this let's do this because uh i want to talk i want to make sure we're going over lucy uh ai and uh and i don't want to run out of time plus i want to ask you some wrap-up questions too G- walk me or let's do this how about let's do this first why don't you give a nice overview of what Lucy AI is today? Let's just tell the listeners about it. And then I'll double back and ask you questions on how you guys got it started. Uh, sounds cool. Um, well, the, the, the bottom line is all uh, truth is at all levels at all businesses, there is a, a, a standard problem, which is I can't find what I'm looking for in my data. Yeah. And but by data, and most people talk about big data and all these things, they're talking about databases, calendar data, other stuff. Mm-hmm. We don't really focus on that. We talk, we count on less on data and more on knowledge. And so knowledge management is the category. And so enterprise knowledge management, we have a tool, Lucy, who reads, watches, and listens to all of the documents stored on your file servers, SharePoint, OneDrive box, strap box, wherever they exist across the entire enterprise. HubSpot, whatever you're using. Yeah. Salesforce. Salesforce. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just where, wherever and whatever that is. Google drive, so, Google drive, whatever. Google how, drive. Yeah. How about, how about data or information or videos on your social media feeds or your social channels? Uh, it does not, it would not look at the social channel, but it would look, you would have the source file on your file server before you put it up there. Gotcha. So, okay. Okay. So, um, and so then what it's an answer engine, not a search engine. So you ask Lucy a question in natural language. What is the top selling uh, soft drink to millennials in Idaho in 2021? If you, if you were a soft drink maker or whatever. Yeah. And the reason I use soft drinks as a great example is because one of our clients who very publicly talks about using Lucy is Pepsi. Oh, I see. Okay. I got so, you. So, uh, so Pepsi, uh, uh, and actually calls it Ada and ADA, Ada, named after Ada Lovelace, the first computer programmer. Um, and uh, so Pepsi has a global view of, uh, of all of this data and Lucy's busy reading, watching and listening. And then so think about a PowerPoint deck and think about how many PowerPoint decks companies create every day because it's, it's measured in the thousands or tens of thousands PowerPoint decks every day. Yep. And then you think about the PowerPoint deck that I created last month and I'm trying to find on my own hard drive. Yes. yes. <laughs> I can't find it. Yes. But now I want to say, I want to be able to find people in my work group, people in my division, people in my company, keep, you know, people across the enterprise and be able to leverage, um, uh, what we can share. Mm. And so Lucy has read, watch, and listened to everything in the company. And then I ask a question and she knows what I'm allowed to see based on what I have access to. And she gives me the answers from what I'm allowed to see. Will it say, will it say, Hey, I have the answer, but you can't see that. Go ask your boss, Bob, and he'll give you. Uh, it, it, it does not. Um, because, and there's all kinds, I mean, we get into government. We, we're actually working with the government and other okay. places. You know, okay. They don't want you to know what you don't need to know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's a catch 22, right? You know, okay. Uh, okay. So they, uh, but in general, uh, you know, we, we're, we're uh, highly secure ISO 27001, which is a security certification. 
We have the we we manage the secrets of companies left and right. Okay. Um, but the idea is, when I say that you know, what's the soft drink in Idaho for millennials? What will come up as an example might be one PowerPoint slide with the answer on it, the chart of of oh, soft see. drinks in I, Idaho. I see. I see. Um, but it's slide sixty eight of a hundred and twenty two page deck. But we just bring up the slide. Here's okay. your answer. Okay. So, okay. and so it's much more focused. So, because if you do a search and it comes up with 10 documents and, only, and each of the 10 documents is only 10 pages long, you have a hundred pages of reading to figure out what your answer is. We so try to not, take you to right. the text. So this is not a, this is not a, like a, Hey Google, uh, and it talks back to you, but it, but it does pull up the document, so to speak. Yeah. We don't, um, we've, we've, we've played with audio. We can do audio as a way to ask the questions. Okay. Uh, it still introduces too many errors. I, I mean, just think about when you use Hey Siri or, or um, yeah. Alexa or whatever, and these companies are spending billions of dollars and there's still errors. Yeah, right. Uh, so, so I'm just going to be clear. We, we don't use audio input because it introduces too many errors. Okay. I see. That said, that part's easy. I could turn that on in a day. Um, but most of our answers are visual in nature. Okay. Now, we do have a new feature that we just came out with, this, which is called Synopsis, which writes an answer that's not in these documents, but writes an answer from these documents of, of what the answer, uh, what Lucy believes the answer to be. Um, and it's really, really cool and powerful, which allows us to do uh, provide access to this kind of resource in your Teams environment, in your Slack environment. You can at Lucy, ask her a question, and she, and she puts the answer in there, the, the synopsis answer, Great. and Great. then you can click through to the visual answers that, that she provides. You know, there's two things that come to my mind immediately. Now, I know you guys fo focus on Fortune, one, Fortune 1000, but even for small, you know, S&B, and we're, we're only a $2 million firm, so we're still a very tiny company, but still. E even when you get to 2 million, your Google drive and your files, it starts to fill up and then there's folders and subfolders. And then Johnny created this. And then now Johnny left and, <clears throat> and now it's six months later. And then Mary comes to work for us. And Mary's like, man, I got this really good idea. I'm going to spend three days creating a, B and C. And then she creates a, B and C and she presents it to somebody. And we're like, yeah, that's already in the system. Johnny created that last year. So we just wasted three days of payroll. <laughs> right. Well, and, and uh, it's, it's 100 percent the case. And this is where we were, where I was talking earlier about onboarding client, onboarding new people yeah. in a COVID and work at home environment. Yes. Because you don't have access to the knowledge, the subject matter experts, the things that you might run into, who to ask, you don't yes. know. Yep. And so if you have Lucy deployed, because um, because the truth is, uh, there was somebody in your job before you got there and That's they did right. all kinds of work. That's right. And there was somebody, uh, and, yes. and all of that work is stored on the G drive or is in share Some, somewhere. <laughs> right. Right. And so, <laughs> and so when you come to work and actually there's some data that, um, uh, LinkedIn, Microsoft just put out, which is that your, your manager is likely to give you about 60% of the knowledge you need to be successful. That sounds right. Right. So, right. so you get about 60% of it and the rest is look at hunt, SharePoint, hunt, hunt. look on the chair. Yeah. And, and again, if anybody who's ever used SharePoint search understands that that's just okay. Yeah. And Microsoft tries to improve it every day. But the other thing is um, it doesn't search across things. It just searches one thing. Mm. And we search, you could have 10 different SharePoint sites. You could have a box, a Dropbox uh, love it. and Salesforce and search them all at the same time. Love it. Love Additionally, it. Love Lucy it. does two other things. She also searches your third-party purchase data. So if you're a subscriber to eMarketer or uh, um, uh, you know, Business Intelligence Insider, those kinds of things, she searches at the same time answers from there. And then the third thing she does, and I said we don't do databases, but we do do data tools. Okay. So if you're using Tableau or Power BI, or some esoteric system, like uh, there's a company called Knowledge Hound, which does uh, cons consumer data, um, consumer survey data, as an example. So we, we don't search those databases, but we search their dashboards. Mm -hmm. So if I say in, in my demo, Lucy, I can say, what, what's the latest data on COVID-19? And, you know, there might be an answer from, um, uh, you know, different 
different I sources. I but see. one of the answers will be from Tableau, and it's a Tableau dashboard that shows, and it's live updating immediately. So I get the most current data when I click on it. It brings up the dashboard, and then if I click through, I could get to the Tableau dashboard in Tableau. Okay. So, this, so we bring data forward. It's like a GPS to all the data you have. So, so my next question is, why why isn't everybody using this? And is there a competitor that you're battling against? Because I'm thinking to myself, wow, sounds great, like a wonderful tool. Uh, if it's affordable for a business, let's do it. So why isn't everybody signed up? And are you battling a competitor? And what's going on? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, in, in good ways, all of the above, uh, the, the, there is an element of, um, and actually we even call our sales process is, uh, the, the first thing we do is give a wow demo okay. and the wow demo is, um, is delivered by the sales rep. It, it's, uh, just, uh, you know, a very short teaser on, uh, and the answer is uniformly. Wow. Yeah. I need this. Yeah. Right. That's, so that's my reaction. Um, <laughs> it, so it's, it, 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 it's a uniform answer. And then there's usually a bigger demo, which they bring more people to the reason we, we were doing big demos and then we did big demos again because they kept adding more and more people. So, so we, we try to, you know, hook, hook the organization Good. or the individual Good. Good. and then, and then drive forward um, uh, through the process. So there is a, a, a couple of things going on in the market. Uh, initially we had no competition and actually that was worse um, because we were creating and educating the market by yeah. ourselves yeah, as a small tough. company. It's that's really tough. hard and yes. very expensive to yep. do. Yep. And so we ended up as the competition started showing up, then there's a conversation, then there's RFPs, then there are things. And we, uh, you know, win these competitions hand down, hands down. Oh, okay. So head to head, six, seven competitors, huge corporations, nice. and and it's a it's a no brainer. Um, no brainer with one caveat: we're not the cheapest opportunity. People, yeah. you know, Which if is, you're buying on price, you're not buying Lucy. That's why. Right. So on, that's one of that's if one you're of buying reasons. on value. Okay. You're buying. And, and let me also say what what nobody calculates incorrectly is the cost of ownership. Because our competition says you have to upload every file you want available into their system and you have to tag it. Our <laughs> system just connects to the server, doesn't touch the data, doesn't okay, remove great. the data. Great. And we automatically monitor ads, changes, and deletes. We automatically tag everything. Okay. And so, you know, like a, a quote from uh, somebody we were talking to who had already bought a competitor. They're like, well, we're six months in and we have like, uh, like 10,000 documents in. And of course we would be six days in and have 10,000 documents in. Now is that, I, you know, that process right there, is that like a special sauce patented trademarked process to where the, your competitors can't do it that way? Well, we have, um, we do have four issued patents in, okay. in, in our portfolio. We have more coming. Okay. Okay. Uh, most of it is, uh, you know, is, is secret sauce, but the, there's okay. a fundamental design thing that our competitors don't have. Okay. Which is, and it's, and it's funny because, so I'm the visionary, like I, I design things on a whiteboard that are just the best world-class technology, but somebody else has to build them. Um, and of course I had a great partner in Mark Dispensa, my CTO and, and, uh, and, you know, he's just brilliant. I mean, it's unbelievable. We have a technology conversation on Wednesday and, you know, he'll call me on Sunday and show me the proof of concept, <laughs> That's cool. uh, you know, like nice. Nice. just mind blowingly nice. unbelievable nice. And, nice. and fantastic. Um, and so, you know, we fundamentally didn't believe that we should upload. We, we think uploading is obsolete. Why okay. would you have to process it? Agreed. The second thing, and I already kind of told you all of this, but, Everybody else tags the 122 slide PowerPoint deck once. So you're going to upload it and you're going to tag what's in there, right? Okay. Okay. But Lucy tags every page. So page 22, page 23, and page 24 come up with different criteria because they say different things. I see. I see. But so fundamentally, if you're manually tagging, 
you cannot keep up with what Lucy's doing in any way, shape or form. Okay. Because it, it's not possible. And the reason you can only upload 10,000 documents in six months is because somebody had to um, yep. do something. Yes. Somebody had to put it there. Yep. Somebody had to tag it. Yeah. And therefore it could be retrieved where I said we could do that in six days, right? We would just connect to your SharePoint. Lucy starts read watching and listening. Lucy starts tagging and every day more files are available. And then we hook up another SharePoint site and another SharePoint site. And next thing you know, we have 200 SharePoint sites in your corporation all connected. We have 20 other data sources connected when we have 60 dashboard sources connected Love and you it. can ask questions across the whole thing. And again, so Love it. yes, we're more expensive, but we don't require a person okay. or a team of people, there you go. which, yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. unbelievably more expensive. Oh, and the other, here's a little secret. Lucy never takes a vacation day. <laughs> Lucy, Lucy never takes a better job and quits. Lucy, you know, you're, if you start relying on people to do stuff, then people mm. do people things. Mm. Um, and so, and the other piece is subject matter expertise, right? We subject matters, big uh, experts, biggest frustrations are answering the same question every day. They want to answer the hard questions. Yes. They want to be challenged. So Lucy answers the easy questions and then escalate. You can escalate it to subject matter experts. And hopefully when they answer the question, it gets fed back into Lucy. So then she knows that answer now too. Very good. Um, by the way, for the listeners, Lucy.ai, Lucy.ai, probably Fortune 1000, but any industry, it doesn't matter. Industry we agnostic. Have, it's industry agnostic. We have lots of people using it. Sales enablement. We have okay. people using it for marketing, okay. people using it for research. Uh, we have customers using it in manufacturing, all the all the plant, okay. you know, all the packaging, plant manuals, everything. So the people who do the maintenance look up how do I fix this okay. uh, and 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 get the right diagram, aircraft engine maintenance manuals, you name it. Did you and your uh, co-founder, you guys bootstrapped it in the beginning, put in your own money, and then since then it looks like you've I saw on LinkedIn there was a Series A of 2.5 million. What I'm just curious. Yeah, who bootstrapped it in the beginning? How much cash have you taken? And are you are you on another round or what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. So there, uh, and there are three co-founders. Just to be clear, Scott oh, okay. and I have been we'll go back 20 x years. Okay. okay. Uh, Mark's been with us for 10 plus years. Okay. Um, and so it's it's the it's the three of us. Okay. Uh, and um, and so and very very much so. So yeah, we started with our with our own money and okay. and then added a little friends and family. The Series A round actually was six million dollars. Oh, um, okay. I'm just looking total. at LinkedIn. I yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm anyway. Okay. So the, it right. was just the the, the there's a the two point five was just the last. Um, oh, I see. BC. Uh, all right. Uh, so okay. so we we and, and and with the Series A we brought in what we you know VC money, professional ooh, money. Ooh, um, ooh. Did you give up? You didn't give up control, did you? Uh, well, control is always a, a funny statement, but no, we didn't give up control. Uh, but there's, there's always, there are some controls put in by the VCs. Yeah. Right? So, uh, so, you, you, yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so having a majority voting control is different than having total control. Agreed. Um, um, are you, do you, I don't know how much of this you want to share, but uh, I guess my, my, you know, I've had so many conversations with, owners that take on cash from PE and VC. And sometimes they tell me they signed a deal with the devil and they wish they hadn't done it. And sometimes they tell me that it's all great and wonderful. I've heard, you know, from one end yeah. of the spectrum to the other. <laughs> so, so first of all, I want to say I, I, I'm eyes open, very aware of all of the above. And I do want to say VC is different than PE in yes. major ways. And so yes. it's a different good and bad. Um, uh, but uh, you know, again, if you want to take the amplification, and so our goal was to go from, uh, you know, you said, why doesn't every company own know about Lucy? The answer is we needed more money to do gotcha. that. Yep. And so this is, a, you know, this is a, a focus on growth round, focus okay. on sales and marketing, okay. um, focus on, on driving the enterprise. Whenever you take money, if you're not performing, you're at risk. Yes. 
<laughs> I mean, there's just no question about it, right? Yes. yes. And um, and so you know, and that that's a real thing. Uh, on the same note, uh, you know, we there's other things that come with the money. There's networks. There's yes. Uh, you know, there there's there are different places uh, that that we can help. Um, and uh, as an example, um, uh, you know, our our board of directors became you know a much more real thing as we took in, uh, as we took in BC. Understood. Are you the chairman? Are you the chairman? Uh, I, I, functionally I am. I don't know that we, I don't know that we have the title. Okay. (laughs) But, but, uh, uh, I'll go with yes, because we don't have, we don't have somebody else there. Um, but one of the VCs brought in a gentleman named, uh, Frank Mergenthaler. And it, it, coincidentally, uh, Mark used to work in Frank's organization Uh years ago. Um, Frank was the um, CFO for IPG, which is one of the world's largest holding companies competing with WPP, who used to own J. Walter Thompson. I see. So, um, so you know, w- w- uh, we're getting exposure to yeah. just uh, yeah. better people, yeah. that uh, yeah. better mentors, better access, uh, all kinds of things. And and the the one thing, you know, a tree that stops growing dies. Yeah. And if you're a CEO, a visionary, you're running your company and you think you have nothing to learn, oh. you will die. <laughs> yeah, right? right. You will die. Yeah. And, I'm, I'm, yeah. and I'm a seasoned multi, you yes. know, <laughs> I mean, I've done all kinds of things and I don't think I don't have stuff to learn. I, well, learn, so, I learn every day. Um, so um, taking the VC money, and I apologize, I know we're at the end of our time here. I'm gonna, I know you probably have another meeting coming up. Um, let me just ask you. So taking the VC though, that tells me that now you're like, okay, grow and scale as fast as we can. And I'm assuming then you'll be targeting an eventual exit somewhere down the road is now the plan. Uh, well, exit, uh, I always think I, I, what I do for a living is create exits. That's okay. what I, that's how, okay. that's the type of entrepreneur I am. That doesn't okay. mean all entrepreneurs should do that. Okay. And if you don't need money, you should never take it. You're okay. much better off having never taken money if you can get to the end zone okay uh there, there's no question in my mind about that okay. um that said uh, and i don't know there's another book which i have on my shelf here but i called crossing the chasm which is uh, uh gregory moore and uh and it's about new technology adoption and it's uh, it's kind of unbelievable uh because it goes way back to like chicken farming technology adoption and it still applies today and um uh, and so we're we have crossed the chasm, but they, they call the if you think of a, you know a, a bell curve statistically, they you take off the two wings and in the center there's this big group of people and they split it. They call that the herd, and and so right now we're on the front half of the herd. Okay. And so we have um, let's just say a three to five year window that's going to determine what percentage of this market we have. Okay. Right. All right. And so this is, this gets into the why we took money, right? Yeah. And so so I have three to five years to attack the Fortune 1,000, 5,000. You can pick your number, but we're we're an enterprise scale software doing unbelievable things, um, unfathomable things across across that enterprise. So I, how do I get to those people? It's expensive. I got to be there, and yep. I got to set yep. this sets the whole trajectory. The second half of the herd follows the first half of the herd. But again, people are making decisions now where, as I said earlier, we were introducing them to concepts. Now people are embarking on the process of picking their, their platforms. Dan, congratulations on everything you've done. I, I could talk to you for another hour. There's like a list of 50 more questions I wanted to ask you, but I know we're out of time. We have to, you have to come back on the show. I'll have to get you back because I uh, wanted to ask you a bunch of other stuff. But uh, Happy to do so. I do have another 10 minutes if you want to. Okay, okay, we- okay, great. If you don't mind, I wanted to ask you a couple of uh, what I call um, outside the lines a little bit, just kind of like drifting outside the lines. Um, yeah, if you don't mind. So, so when I think about data companies collecting information, knowing everything, Technology wise, I guess the question is, do you ever worry about technology in general and and the amount of information and monitoring and everything that we're doing as a species 
Does it ever worry you at all? Uh, yeah. So uh, the answer is, of course, it does. And it okay. should. <laughs> um, uh, the other side of it, which if if you think you're not or can protect yourself, you can't. So uh, and good or bad. And there, there's all kinds of new legislation, not that new um, uh uh, there's a, in Europe, there's a GDPR, which is, which defines the, uh, what you, what and how personal, personal and personalized data can be used. I see. Uh, Canada has some restrictions more directly on, um, emailing and, and, and stopping, you know, kind of the, the spamming. Um, uh, California has two different regulations, uh, one that's in place and one that's, um, already, already in place, but yet to be enacted. Mm. Um, and, and all about privacy, personal privacy, privacy protection, um, and what can be stored, how it can be used. Uh, one of the things in, in GDPR is, uh, and today, if you go to, uh, Google or, uh, Amazon, you can actually request everything they know about you. Oh, oh really? And you, will yeah, you, you get, can you'll see, get an answer. You'll get an answer. Oh, you can see the, you can see your profile and, and then when you clean your pants, uh, and realize <laughs> what they have, um, and, and, and you can also ask to be purged from oh, the, from really? any place because of these, because of these laws. Um, but, but is NASA, it, not NASA, I, I have, is, is, I, is the, is the NSA who who I'm almost positive is tapped to Google with the same information. Are they going to purge your information too? <laughs> so, well, so that's where I was going. The, the information is well beyond where you know say, it exists. Yeah, that, that's exactly. So, right. so the problem exactly. is yeah. that, um, that, that I, I know that Google, Amazon, Facebook, so I could go purge all of those. Yeah, but and then I think I'm pure. Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> and and in, in some ways, Google, Amazon, and Facebook are the good ones, not because they're great companies or anything like that, yeah. but because you actually know what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's the it's the other ones. I mean, um, yeah. From a from a political perspective, there are databases on each side of the fence. Yes, that have thousands of attributes that predict what you care about, what you voted on, how you spend, what you've done yes. that you don't know where it is and you don't know how to get yourself purged from. Is and isn't it true and I don't want to go too conspiracy, but isn't it true that that certain government agencies early on were were supporting and helping Google and Facebook and these people because they're like, "Wow, this is great. This is going to be awesome because we need all this data on all these people." Um, I don't know that, uh, you know, the funny part is I'm going to, I'm going to say this differently in hindsight, it might've happened, but the reality was, if you think our government has the foresight to do that, then you, then you are the fool. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> and I don't mean to say, I mean, and I don't mean like, like they're not organized enough. They're not. Okay. Well, they, they, you'd have to, I don't, Google didn't even know what they were doing. Well, that's true. To get there. No, that's true. Right? What the, the asset that, that Facebook, Google, and everybody, you know, Amazon came up with turned out to be data. I, turned out to be data. Yeah. But they didn't go, none of the three went out thinking, I'm going to sell data. I got you. What they did think is I'm going to sell advertising or product. Right. And how do I do that better? Right. And it right. turned out data was the answer i see i see but, this... but so so to think the government knew that they were going to find that they were going to collect the data in advance Not in advance I, okay okay gotcha. i just want to call bull i just want to call bullshit <laughs> it's because it's bullshit and but but in the you know again there's these data sources that do exist yeah and again in the 90s i was out speaking and people were or, you know, again, I'm not going to put my credit card. on. Oh, I internet. remember those. Yeah. I remember those days. Yeah. People were but like, guess I'm not what? Putting... I would yeah. walk into a gas station and hand it to a convicted felon <laughs> or a restaurant, hand it to a convicted felon. <laughs> You're so true. And, and so, so true. my statement is the digitization. And now you'll, we're seeing uh, this, the single transaction has no value. It's not the swipe of the card that people try to steal, although they do, with scanners and other stuff, yeah. they're trying to get to the database behind it. 
And the truth is, the database behind it is the same database if I swipe it in the gas station, in the restaurant, or on the internet. Mm. It goes into the database, and mm. that's where people try to steal the stuff. Mm. I got, so again, I got, I, like, I, like you're so busy protecting yourself, and I don't disagree. We need to protect ourselves. Well, as much um, as you can. I got one more. I got one more outside the lines questions for you. This is another one. I don't know if you want to answer on this. Should, let's use Google or Facebook. I guess either one. Should these organizations, and when I say Google, I'm including YouTube. So let's let's include YouTube in that. Should these organizations be able to just turn people off whenever they want, wipe people off of their so their platforms? Um, the, you know, this is a much uh, <laughs> a much <laughs> deeper question than we have time to talk about. There are attributes of there's two sides to it. One of which is they're private enterprises. I know. And, and, um, and so, and we have the right to serve or not serve all kinds of things in a private enterprise, make our own rules. And, and it's funny because, you know, as you get into these highly politicized arguments and conversations, the disagreement with each side's own ideologies when they start doing other stuff, <laughs> you know, like, like if you look at again the right or the left, and I'm not, they're, they're both they both do this, so it's not it's not like I'm picking on one. Yeah. But you know, you start going on. Well, should they do that? Well, uh, but we're anti legislation, but we want to legislate all kinds of stuff here, or <laughs> you know, and 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 vice versa. I mean, it's so it's so ironic. No, it's just people picking and choosing what they care about. True. Now they're private enterprises, and they don't have. Um, and unlike public broadcasting. And I don't mean PBS, I mean broadcasting where we control the airwaves and we give a license oh, right. to somebody who controls the airwaves. So radio, yeah, and it's and it's terrestrial radio, not you know, not uh, satellite radio. And it's television, and again, it's not all television, it's broadcast television, are controlled because they are licensed from the US government. Ah, uh -huh. that's right. Okay. And so, so, and then we start applying the same principles mm. to other enterprises, which aren't. Mm, mm, mm. Good point. And so, 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 and, and again, and I'm not saying that we should or shouldn't, because you can argue that we should. I just want to be clear. It is not a distinct right that we have to publish on YouTube because there is no government subsidy and there is no license from the government. It's just a private enterprise. So I agree with and, that. I agree with that. My question though is how big and how much more big and powerful does Google have to get before somebody does say, hey man? Well, uh, I think what's gonna happen is more on the lines of antitrust. Okay. And so so it's more likely that uh, you think they'll split Google, up? You, you think you think they'll be forced to split up? At some point. Uh, that's what happened. I mean, that's it's happened. It let's happened go all to, the way. Let's go all the way back to Rockefeller when they're like, "Hey, bro, right, you, so, you, right, you can't so control companies. all the oil." <laughs> right. So, I mean, we did it to oil companies. We did it to the telephone companies. Yes. yes um, we've yes. done it. Uh, we've con we've done things to IBM and Microsoft and yeah. other ways that they yeah. that, that they manipulated and controlled the market, and that is an issue, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's but that's where we cross over, not because, um, and actually, the funniest part is. The, t the people who are objecting that go and start their own network are actually hurting their argument of the monopoly. Because if you have a place to do it and all of a sudden there's a hundred places to do it. So um, then you can't say, well, the one that that's the only place I can do it. That, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, and I'm, again, I, I, I don't mean to get political here because I'm not, I'm, I'm staying right in the middle of everything. Yeah. Yeah. But the bottom line is we have to understand Again, there's the, um, this is again going back to entrepreneurs. Yeah, I I train our people that there's a difference between legal and illegal and right and wrong. So I don't, uh, and I don't. I'm not saying that you should do illegal things, but you shouldn't do all legal things because they're legal. You should do legal things that are right. Ooh, good one. Not legal things that are wrong. And my test is if whatever you're about to do ends up on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow or the website or whatever. Um, and the ultimate person you don't want to see it is going to read it. Would you still do it? That's good, Dan. That's, that's the answer. Not it's legal. 
That's good, Dan. Because legal is a shitty definition of mm-hmm. what you should do. Ooh. Good stuff, my and friend. So, good stuff. So that's where I go on the big picture here, which is, you know, maybe YouTube needs to do better because it's the right thing to do. Mm. Maybe they'll do better because they have pressure to do it. Maybe they'll do better because the government and antitrust and other places are looking at what they should do. Um, but just to say that we have a right to tell them what to do as a private enterprise mm. is crossing lines that we have to decide to cross. Yeah. Right? That's a really big philosophical crossing it is. Um, because, because I don't want them to come into my business and tell me what I can do. Right there. You just hit it on the head. I, I, I t- you just hit it on the head. I've told people many times, because I've said the words, hey, this isn't cool for, for Google to to do this. And I can't believe they just took this person off YouTube. Like I've said that to people in conversation. But then I've turned right around and said, well, I don't want the government telling me what to do with Rider Flex. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the, that's the trade-off. Because if you yeah. go down, it's not yes. just to those companies. It's yes. to all companies. That's right. So and it's a, it's and uh, again, uh, what we control is we vote with our dollars. We vote with yep. our eyeballs. Yeah, And so leaving Google or leaving um, uh, YouTube for their actions or whatever is the way you vote. And, 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 and again, we vote in, in elections. So the craziest part in our country is only half the people vote. So and, and my attitude is, did you vote? If you didn't vote, I don't want to hear from you. <laughs> right. Totally. Because your opportunity to change something is in the vote, not in social media not in social media right, right. so yeah. so yeah. and again i'm not saying don't post social media but if you didn't vote you you lose the right to have an opinion that should have been reflected in how the election went i totally agree dan awesome stuff i could talk to you for another two hours man you'll have to come back on the show wonderful information thank you for sharing your story congratulations on everything you've done in your career and congrats on on lucy ai really appreciate you sharing Uh, Pleasure. Great to meet you. Great to spend a little time and happy to come back.